Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Palo Window and Door of Georgia. How much fun was to be in Athens on Saturday for those of us lucky enough to be there, and for those of you that were tuned in to watch it via the streaming platform. Hopefully you had a good time with family and friends there as well. We have got a lot to unpack, as they say, from G-Day. Now, y'all already know the drill. We can't do all of this in one day. We're going to talk about some of the highlights, the high marks, the sort of, I would say, perhaps most important topics today. And as we kind of roll through the week, we'll see how much more of this we can get into. I think the number one headline is defense sort of uh, provided a little bit of a retort to those who thought that the offense was getting the best in these scrimmages thus far this spring. Defense kind of had their say on Saturday. What does that mean for Carson Beck? We'll address that. Uh, who were the standout performers? We'll talk about that. And just exactly what was it about the Georgia defense that was demonstrated in this 2020 tie that, for the most part, uh, seemed like a little bit of a nod in the direction of uh, of that defensive side of the ball. Georgia also got a commit over the weekend. We'll probably save a little bit of the uh, talk on a K- a to uh, tomorrow, perhaps. John Stinchcomb joins us here today. So busy with a lot, kind of post-G-Day, also trembling with the notion that the transfer portal is also getting ready to open there as well. So we're covering all of that ground. Glad to have you with us for it. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Pella, a window and door of Georgia, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Pella Window and Door of Georgia, viewed to be the best. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. I love Star Wars, and, you know, lately my kids and our our whole family, you know, we kind of do a little tradition at night, kind of settling down after a busy day. We'll sort of watch a little bit of a movie that's kind of our sort of wind down moment for the day. We've been going back and rewatching all the Star Wars movies as of late and, you know, watching that original trilogy. It, I am once again, absolutely of the belief that the best star Wars movie that's ever been made is the empire strikes back. I just love it. And when you go back and watch that, you're kind of reminded of how you felt when you're a kid, obviously. And it's just sort of a cool storyline and a little bit unlike a lot of other sort of big blockbuster movies that are out there, because in a roundabout way, the, bad guys sort of won the the good guys that had their moment in the original movie and yet the sequel was about you know the empire striking back the 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 empire getting back to even again with the good guys after what had happened in the original movie which obviously came out in 1977 and i think there was a little bit of that for g day on saturday which is not to suggest that i think of the uh, Georgia defense as the bad guys here. But I do think there are some galactic empire qualities, if you've seen Star Wars, but the way in which the Georgia defense goes about its business, you know, sort of dominant and uh, just striking fear in the uh, heart of all opponents. So I don't think of the Georgia defense being bad guys, but I do think they sort of operate the same way that the empire would in some of those old Star Wars movies. And after a time in which, hey, you know, uh, the Georgia defense is sort of maybe taking its lumps during spring practice. And some of this was kind of based on rumor and innuendo of, well, the Georgia offense is doing this and so-and-so is doing that. And maybe the Georgia defense didn't quite do as well. In fact, Kirby Smart himself sort of confirmed that after the first scrimmage of didn't stop the run as well as we need to and didn't do this, didn't do that. For the most part on Saturday, the Georgia defense struck back. For the most part, the Georgia defense would hurt all these people hyping up All this stuff related to the Georgia offense, knowing that the eyes of the TV audience are going to be on the game and that there are going to be tens upon tens and tens of thousands of fans there in the stadium and media types such as ourselves are going to be there ready to kind of hype up whatever it was that we saw. This Georgia defense wanted to answer back in a big way. And Kirby Smart, when he kicked off his postgame press conference, after what was really a 20-20 to tie, but ultimately that result itself probably doesn't mean a whole lot. Kirby did kind of acknowledge, hey, this was a defense that sort of responded to what had maybe been some challenges in previous scrimmages earlier during the spring. This is how Kirby Smart kind of summed all of that up after spring practice concluded with G-Day on Saturday. I thought the defense played much better today than they did in previous scrimmages in terms of like energy, enthusiasm, run to the ball. We rushed the passer better today. Offense probably didn't have as good a day as maybe they've had in the two scrimmages, but some of that was dictated by the uh, 
the, the terms of which we scrimmaged with, which was passing and, and loose plays, and uh, they did a nice job uh, handling that in the second half. So put a pin in that last part about what the offense did, and in particular Carson Beck, because, you know, Beck's a famous guy and a, a sort of the most recognizable figure currently involved with Georgia football. So a lot of the initial takes on a screen, spring scrimmage game like this are going to be centered around Beck. So coming up in just a few minutes here, we'll get more into the Carson back part of what Saturday was. But I want to focus on the initial part of that Kirby Smart statement for a moment here and the fact that it was a better day defensively than it had been. Now, to me, there are sort of two important takeaways from that. First of all, if you'll kind of ask me, you know, how will the 2024 G-Day be remembered? For me, I'm going to remember this in terms of just a long list of names and focusing on defense here for a moment, long list of names of guys that I saw a flash for a brief period of time and saw enough of them to say, boy, I'd like to see more. You know, I can't wait to see more. Can't wait to see them doing some of this kind of stuff against a team wearing a different color Jersey coming up in September, October, whatever of, of, of the upcoming year. And I'm sure you've got your own list there as well. In fact, you know, you think about a you know a Daniel Harris or a Chris Cole or a KJ Bolden or a Joseph Jonah Johnye, CJ Allen, Dalen Everett, uh, Julian Humphrey. You know, at various times, those guys in the list could get even longer uh, of, of guys who you saw. Wow, look at him flying to the football. Look at the length on this guy. Look at the speed on that guy. You know, look at the the way in which so and so fought and and did this. It just sort of seemed like the overall. Um, list of guys who had moments where they flashed and impressed. It just seemed like on G day, that was very, very long. And obviously over the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll continue to continue to kind of unpack some of that. But the other thing about the Georgia defense on Saturday, and this is just one of the things that has made Georgia, Georgia was the way in which Georgia went about its business. Obviously there's talent and obviously some of these newcomers We're excited to see more of them. But this G-Day spring scrimmage, especially in a day and age in which Ole Miss is a glorified field day and, you know, a lot of these other things sort of feel like vacation Bible school with the, you know, Red Rover, Red Rover, send so-and-so right over. You know, like a lot of things that are going on right now don't really feel like spring games and some teams barely even have a spring game at all. As we said a lot going into Saturday – Georgia still makes this feel like football. And when Georgia's out there playing something close to real football, you see the way in which real football players emerge. And that was the other thing about the Georgia defense on Saturday. And perhaps nothing kind of encapsulates that more than something that Kirby Smart was saying about Jalen Walker. But the fact that Walker, the very good Georgia linebacker, has been a little bit banged up thus far this spring. And yet Jalen's commitment with the understanding that how you do anything is how you do everything Jalen's commitment to want to be out there on Saturday, even though it wasn't a real game, demonstrates what a real football player he really is. And when you think about the overall good day for the Georgia defense, it's the sort of mindset that it approaches stuff like this with that I think reminds us of why it is that this unit has had so much success in recent years. This is what Kirby said about Jalen Walker. I thought this was great. You know, Jalen missed a lot of time this spring with a with an ankle injury, and today was his first day back. And, you know, it doesn't say enough about our team. The kids are trying to get out of spring games all around the country, and this guy was mad that we were thinking about not playing him. I mean, he wanted to play. He wanted to go out there and compete and get better and um, really appreciate Jalen's leadership and the way he handles things. So we have said before that we think this year's Georgia team – could be a little bit more led by quarterback and a little bit more led by offense overall than we're kind of used to Kirby Smart era teams being. And just the prodigious nature of the offensive talent may be the reason why that's so if it turns out to be that way. But as Kirby describes Jalen Walker there, and as you see guys playing around Walker on Saturday, you're kind of reminded about the spiritual value of this Georgia defense overall. They bring sort of an intangible quality in addition to their own very impressive talent, and a guy like Jalen Walker demonstrating that on the fact that, hey, I want to be out there, I want to do things, I want to lead my team. And by the way, if you're watching a video, how good is a lot of this video that our uh, uh, producer and colleague Cody Chaffins uh, put together here? I mean, I don't think the show's ever looked better on video than it's looking here right now, and I just want to kind of point that out. Sharp stuff there from Walker. And, you know, if you're listening podcasts, which we're always thankful to have you, it may be worth checking out some of this video. 
uh, just because it looks so good on screen. But the point is, is that Walker, I think, sets a high standard for how Georgia wants to operate. And this isn't just the theatrics, because admittedly a lot last week, I, I was you know kind of into, hey, good for Georgia and t- making this feel like a real football game. It's fun for fans to sort of see the teams divided up and have normal scoring and I, I kind of talked on Saturday a little bit about the the red shakers for half the stadium, the black shakers for half the stadium, almost like it's two different teams and two different fan bases. That Georgia kind of gets the theatric part of this right, making G-Day still feel something like a real football game. But as Kirby Smart was talking on Saturday, it kind of occurred to me that this is more than just the optics. This is more than just the, uh, the, the uh, attempt to sort of make something look good on TV or feel good to the fans who are in the stadium. As Smart pointed out, you know, when you take the right approach, uh, a right approach, I should say, during this time of year, it can set you up to have the sort of success that you want to have during the fall. Because take account of a guy like Mikhail Williams for a moment. Williams, pound for pound, may have been the single most impressive player on Saturday. Had an interception, had a good number of uh, deflected passes, seemed to be the sort of unblockable force at times that Georgia fans believe he can be for this upcoming season. And when Smart was talking about Mikel during the post-game press conference, he kind of veered in that direction of the way in which they've specifically challenged Mikel, that this springtime of year is more than just some glorified walkthroughs leading up to a made-for-TV event that sort of approximates real football. As Smart says, if you get off to the right start with your year during this portion of the year, you can be set up for the kind of success that will make you a household name by the time the season is done. And when you hear Smart talking about Mikel, I think it reinforces the fact that G-Day truly does matter or G-Day as the punctuation mark to the entirety of spring practice, that really matters. And Smart talking about Mikel Williams, I think reinforces how true that is. Once again, here's Kirby Smart. First and foremost, he's been, um, this is the right word, present. He's been able to practice. He has not. I mean, he had spring practice last year. He missed some practice. He had fall camp last year. He missed some practice. And I explained to him, you know, if you want to have a really good year, you want to have a really good camp. He's kind of bought into that. Like, practicing good makes you better. You can't – it's not his fault in the but you can't play good if you don't practice. So I felt that he had a really good spring from a standpoint of leadership, uh, toughness. Uh, and he didn't get a ton of reps. I mean, the guy's been a two-year starter, but – uh, it'll be you know a chance to get Ty more reps when we come back in the fall. Uh, continue to to increase Joseph uh, Jelly Jai and then Justin Green. So we got some defensive ends that can spell him. But he was a um, he was a, a factor today. So I love that from Kirby Smart. That spring practice isn't some sort of separate entity that's disconnected from the rest of the football calendar. That the hopes of having a good season and becoming a High value first round draft pick, perhaps at the end of this upcoming NFL, at the end of at the, in the next year's NFL draft, or you know, being an All American level player, or someone who just sort of dominates the way in which we've come to expect Georgia players to be able to do on that side of the ball. The kind of good season you want to have begins with a good spring, and not just for Mikael Williams, who was I thought sensational on Saturday, but the entirety of the Georgia defense overall. That this was a little bit of a Georgia defense strikes back moment. This is a unit that took its lumps a little bit last year because it wasn't as dominant as it has been in the past. Whispers and some of this coming directly from Kirby Smart would have led you to believe that maybe they weren't also getting the best of the Georgia offense during a lot of these spring scrimmages over the course of the last month either. But they certainly more than held their own on Saturday. And for as much as this fall, we're excited about what a Carson Beck team can be and what the kind of receiving talent that Beck could have around him, what that could accomplish – a group of Georgia running backs who perhaps played a little bit better on Saturday than many would have expected them to do. For as much excitement and optimism and enthusiasm as there is on that side of the ball, the Georgia defense reminded me on Saturday, they have been a major component in national championship teams in the past. And here in 2024, they could be ready to do that all over again. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented today by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We are happy to have you with us, no matter how you get to us, live on video, 10 a.m. across all platforms, radio, Athens Sports Radio 960F podcast, wherever you find them, Apple, Spotify, worldfamousdognation.com. Just really happy to have you here. 
And so thankful to our friends at Pella Window and Door of Georgia who make it all possible. You know, equipping your house with energy-efficient windows and doors. This is that time of year. It was really warm for the most part all weekend long. That means air conditionings are on. And AC's kind of expensive, right? And if you have improperly fitted windows, poorly sealed doors, that's a loss of energy efficiency, which means you may be paying for, you know, big bucks for some of this AC, and it's like sort of creeping out of your house before it gets a chance to really keep you and your family as cool as you'd like for it too. But that's not going to be the issue when it comes to our friends at Pella Window and Door of Georgia. They're going to give you those energy efficient windows and doors that keeps that uh, air conditioning on the inside of the house exactly where it's supposed to be and keeping you all feeling cool and comfortable all spring and summer long. It's also going to make your home look better on the outside and curb appeal is always a valuable asset to have when it comes to your home. And that's why you want to have a conversation right now with one of those Pella experts. Now, this is the way you can get that done. You can go visit them yourself. They're at their experience center in Duluth. I think that's always a great way to kind of, I'm a little bit of a tactile person. I like to put my hands on things. You can touch the doors. You can touch the windows. You can feel what makes them different and why they are viewed to be the best, more than just a slogan when it comes to Pella Window and Door of Georgia. But if you value your convenience, our friends at Pella, one of those Pella experts, can come out and visit you there as well at your own home. And this is a no-pressure consultation. They're not trying to push you towards something. They simply want to educate you on why their product is what you need when it's time to upgrade your windows and doors, make your house look as good as it can and feel as good as it possibly can there as well. You can reach out to them by giving them a call, 678-638-1429. That's 678-638-1429. You can also give them a, a look up online at PellaofGA.com slash DogNation. One more time on that website, PellaofGA.com slash DogNation. Between now and the end of the month, you can get 10% off your Pella project and 0% APR for 24 months with payment. So good savings right now there as well. So find them and uh, make sure you tell them that BA from Dog Nation Daily so they take good care of you because I truly know that they will because that's what they've been doing for folks in our audience for a very long time. Pella Window and Door of Georgia is viewed to be the best. All right, we're going to get John Stinchcomb here in a moment. Uh, a lot to discuss with John today about how G-Day played out on Saturday. But prior to that, I'm going to go around the doghouse. And it's poured today by our friends at Dr. Pepper. And I want to address what I think was maybe the number one fan concern from Saturday that, well, if there's a good performance from the Georgia defense, if they're doing some good things, that means at times maybe it wasn't the best day for the Georgia offense overall. And perhaps especially early, uh, a few more misfires than you would have liked to have seen from Georgia quarterback Carson Beck. Now, let me give you one sort of scene setter to kind of talk about this in the uh, proper context. There was a moment, I was at halftime, I guess, when, uh, you know, Kirby Smart was standing there with uh, Brock Bowers and kind of acknowledging him as winning the Mackey Award again for a second time. And Kirby kind of did the we're not worthy bow to Bowers, which is very funny. And just sort of gives you an idea of the fact that Kirby overall is pretty relaxed. And I would say that, you know, much the same way that any coach sets the tone for his players in terms of how they feel emotionally, I would say for the overall fan base of Dog Nation, that's probably a pretty good idea too. take your emotional cue from Kirby Smart. And if, if he's relaxed, then perhaps you ought to be relaxed there as well. And so for some Georgia fans who weren't quite so sure what they got from Carson Beck, as we played for you early, Kirby kind of caveated some of this with, you know, keep in mind, we're throwing it more than we typically do. Uh, defense sort of knows what's coming. The same group's been battling the offense all year long. So maybe don't read too much into any of that in terms of what was a day in which Beck admittedly wasn't perfect and probably was, you know, certainly at times inaccurate on a couple of deep throws, especially early in the game. As far as the overall evaluation of Carson, this is what else Kirby had to to say about that there on Saturday, how he thought Carson Beck performed in what is likely to be his final G day in a Georgia uniform. One more time to hear from Kirby Smart. Carson had a great spring to me. He's had a quiet leadership. He's got a lot of confidence. When things aren't going well, to kids and players and O-line turned to him. He had a really good moxie out on the field. He never, you know, pressed or, or got frustrated even today. He, he drove the team down and made some really elite throws there at the end uh, to give us a chance to to tie the ball game. But in, in taking today out of it, I mean, I don't, I don't even go off today. He's had a good spring. He's just – he knows how to navigate a pocket. He knows where to go with the ball. There's nothing he hasn't seen on defense. So I'm, I'm happy with where he is. I want him to continue to grow as a leader. 
So the question you ask yourself is, and this is obviously a rhetorical question, what would you rather be true? A player has a great spring and maybe at times a little shaky on G day or someone has, you know, kind of a less than stellar spring practice punctuated by an awesome performance on G day. Obviously, if you're better on G day than you've been during the spring, there's a very good possibility that what you perform, the way that you perform in spring game could end up being a false positive. Everything we've been told all spring long is exactly what Kirby Smart described there, a player who's had a tremendous spring practice. And a couple of missed fires and a couple of deep balls doesn't change my overall impression of back that he is the best returning quarterback in America. I, I, I do get where fans are coming from some on this when all you've heard are all these good things about Carson Beck. You want to get the full entertainment value out of Beck playing as well as he possibly could? I, I do totally understand that. And I obviously also completely understand why Carson is going to be the focal point of discussion after a, a, a scrimmage like this because he is by far and away the most famous player on the team. I, I do get why the chatter exists. But I don't know that there was anything about Saturday for Bag that was demonstrative of what his overall season is going to be. This wasn't really Georgia's offense in terms of run-pass ratio and the kinds of passing plays that Georgia was running. This wasn't exactly that. But even in addition to all of that, there was still a lot to like from the Georgia offense. As we discussed during our post-game show on Saturday, Colby Young seemed like he was as advertised. The overall Georgia running back performance was pretty impressive. Anthony Evans had a couple of nice moments there as well. But even in the midst of a day in which we probably came away praising defense more than offense, there were still plenty of moments of the Georgia offense, and I think plenty of reason to still believe that Georgia's going to be in more than capable hands with Carson Beck as quarterback here this season. And that is Around the Doghouse here today on Dog Nation Daily, poured by our friends at Dr. Pepper. Busy weekend for us uh even after G-Day, right? You know, kids just running around doing all kinds of stuff. And so, you know, yesterday after kind of being a – we did just so many different things. You kind of come home, you sort of plop down, and literally I go to the re re refrigerator, walk right over, pull out a Dr. Pepper, and I just plop down on the couch and just try to relax for a couple of minutes. And when I get ready to relax and kind of take a little bit of a break from the busy things I have going on, it is a Dr. Pepper I'm turning to to make that moment as enjoyable as it can possibly be. The rich, one-of-a-kind flavor – of Dr. Pepper blended with 23 different flavors overall. That's why we say it's a pepper thing, whether it's Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar, Diet Dr. Pepper, uh, Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream. You've heard us talk about that before. There are all kinds of fun options for you out there on this. But just know that on this show, we're always pretty well powered by Dr. Pepper, today included. And so we want you to be there as well. So if you're shopping there at your local Kroger or wherever it is you're picking up your groceries, pick up some Dr. Pepper today because it's not just a soda. Uh, it's it's a, a one-of-a-kind, delicious uh, uh, level of flavor for you to enjoy. It truly is a pepper thing. Great to have Dr. Pepper uh, bringing around the doghouse to us here today. And great to have John Stinchcomb coming up there as well. A lot to discuss as it relates to G-Day there on Saturday and kind of what comes next for Georgia after all of that. So let's get into some of the individual names and how it was all performed, and let's also at least pay a little bit of uh, mind here to that ominous transfer portal that's kind of floating off in the corner here, knowing that's about to open up, and there could be some drama, not just for Georgia, but all of college football as it relates to that. Let's cover all that ground right now. John Stinchcomb here today on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insight. We will say hello to John Stinchcomb. Always great to have him as part of Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. And, John, your breakdown of what you saw from G-Day, very valuable to us. So, I guess let me start this way. Uh, my initial takeaway, probably a little bit better day for the defense than the offense. Uh, not the kind of thing that makes me concerned about the Georgia offense overall, but you know, perhaps a, a Georgia defense that maybe had heard some of the things that people were saying about him over the course of the last few weeks and what was kind of said about this group after, you know, last season in which it probably wasn't quite the same level it had been in a couple of national championship seasons. Is that your takeaway, too, that maybe pound for pound defense got the best of the offense and what was otherwise a 2020 tie? Yeah, I think it's your standard scrimmage. You know, it's G-Day where – you can't really look too far into the statistics or, or what you saw. It is about as vanilla as you can get. Even 
you know, late in the, in the G day where most of the time they would have gone for two. You hear coach smart saying, we don't want to reveal some of our two point plays. So to think that uh, there's a little bit of a handicap here would be an understatement as to the, the performance that we saw on Saturday. With that said, you can still get a lot of great information. How do you run the, the nuts and bolts, the meats and potatoes of what you're doing schematically on both sides of the ball? It's individual matchups and, and performance. And I think we saw a lot of guys that we've seen progress from, which is exactly what I'm looking for in a, in a spring training culmination at the end of a few weeks of practice is where are guys at? How have they progressed? You know, there's holes that need to be filled and it appears that there's some very viable candidates. Uh, and it also gave us our, our first shot at seeing some of these transfers and first year guys what they look like in the red and black. Yeah, as I said, I don't make a huge deal out of, I would say, less than a perfect day uh, from Carson Bag, but I also want to acknowledge the the fan discussion about this of after all they'd heard about Carson, you know, coming into the game, I think they were kind of hoping for this like laser show type performance. And maybe for Carson on Saturday, it stopped a little bit short of, of being that. If you did evaluate what you were able to see from Carson and trying to put aside what you think you already know about him, what other people are, have said they've seen from Carson in other moments you know, here this spring. If you could only evaluate what you saw from Carson on Saturday, what would your takeaway on him be? Yeah, it would be different than what my takeaway is. I, mean, I, think, I think if you look in a vacuum on a singular performance on Saturday, wasn't great. Now, a tip, tip ball that ends up in an interception, I don't really, you know, that's going to happen. I, it doesn't seem to be his MO. He's a taller guy, so those kind of plays are rarities, but uh, all in all, I, I'm glad that I don't have to base an analysis on one given spring practice. And for any player, I think more than anything, we all should leave with the utmost of confidence. You know, for those that saw the, the day in and day out of Carson's performance, one last season and two throughout this spring, uh, we should have a heck of a lot. There's there's other places where there might be question marks more in depth than anything else. But quarterback is not a concern for me. I, I'm fully anticipatory that he's going to have an exceptional year and that, you know, Saturday was not his best performance and nor do we need it to be. How about Gunnar Stockton here for a moment? Because this is a guy that I had said going into the scrimmage that I was maybe as interested in as anybody because, you know, this can be a big year for Gunner. Hey, you got to have a capable backup quarterback, as you and I have discussed before. And also, this is maybe the next step towards what might be Gunner Stockton as the starting quarterback for 2025. And while we're all focused on this year, we're going to want Georgia to have a good starting quarterback in 2025 once we get there as well. And, you know, I liked some of what I saw from Stockton. I thought he made a couple of really nice throws. You know, I think the day for him probably stopped short of being, oh, my gosh, you know, th this is the next big thing. But I don't know that you could have proven that on G-Day anyway. So, you know, Stockton, I was probably looking to watch a little bit more closely and perhaps a little bit more willing to nitpick some of the stuff with him uh, compared to, to, to Beck because we got a full season's worth of seeing what Carson Beck is like as a starting quarterback. And, you know, I, I, I'm just curious from your perspective how you thought that Gunner performed. Yeah, I, I mean, it, he had a ton of reps. I know that, especially with – Puglisi not taking his, any of those reps because of a, a knee injury. So uh, he had a lot of opportunity. With that said, what he brings to the table is, one, creation of off-schedule plays. You're not going to see that in G-Day. Yep. Two, you can set plays for his mobility that give him more option. We didn't see a lot of that either. So uh, to take away two aspects of his game that could make him much more dynamic – um, I think that needs to be a part of his evaluation. So you're evaluating him on how he runs the, the vanilla formation of this Georgia offense. And, you know, it was mediocre. And mm -hmm. I, that's not unsurprising to me. I think more than anything, it's an evaluation of how does he manage the, uh, the 75% of that play sheet that, applies to any of the quarterbacks that that are wearing a G on the side of their helmet. And uh, I think you actually, you get him in a game situation or you're game planning for him and it looks a heck of a lot different. So again, I, I take all these evaluations with a huge grain of salt. It's, it's a good 
uh, insight into where they're at and their development, but it, it certainly isn't an indication of, well, if they perform really well in spring practice or in G day, then they're going to have a great year. And if they don't, then we're in trouble. Uh, I think we've seen in the past, it's, it's almost an annual basis where there's some player, usually it's a walk on late in that G day where you go, Ooh, he could be a factor. And that never really materializes. Uh, and that's a good indication that, um, you can only put so much weight and credibility in what you see in a G day and, and understand that it's only a very small microcosm of a much bigger picture. I asked you last week what you were looking to see. And one of the things you mentioned was kind of a dynamic level of play on the edge of this defense that kind of that sort of front group anyway, probably have probably needs to be better. And that perhaps a little bit more, you know, dynamic play coming from edge rusher defensive end and, to me, that's what Mikhail Williams was on Saturday, deflecting passes, getting an interception, just at times looking like the force that I think we sort of believe that Mikhail Williams can really be here this year. Did Mikhail provide the answer to what you were hoping to see from that group and maybe beyond him, anything else that sort of stood out there as it relates to that part of the game? Yes, absolutely. Two players caught my attention. Obviously, Williams being the first and foremost, I he looks like your play in, play out, edge setter, difference maker that Georgia needs. Well, one, that's a big human. So to see him stand up as much as he did uh, and then perform well, there's it's a transition. You go from having your hand in the dirt and then uh, being in a two-point race car stance uh, and then making plays in space. That's not always easy for a guy that's used to everything being in a much more contained area. So he was very impressive. I, I'm excited to see what this season holds. I think uh, we'll be able to call his name just because of the ask that is going to be of him this coming season is going to be so considerably different than what we've seen in the past. I mean, obviously this defense isn't uh, keyed on an individual's performance. It is team first, unit first, everyone play your role. With that said, He's a difference maker. Another guy that that caught my attention in flashes uh, was Gabe Harris. And he's a guy that he's got that quick twitch and can be a real difference maker situationally. So two guys that, you know, if you're watching the edge and you're looking for, you know, do we do we have an upgrade there? Is there a performance edge that we could see potentially on Saturday? I think the answer is yes. And, you know, it was obviously those two were, uh, on the sheet that you had highlighted and in anticipatory as to what they might be able to do. And I think they answered that call. I think it's more about consistency for some of these younger players and, and how they can carve out their role uh, once we get to August and, and rolling into the season. But, um, I, you know, I was excited about what I saw coming off the edge. If we uh, broaden this out kind of for one more question about G-Day, about – and you know how it is, John. It's like there's more about a game like this that can be talked about in one day. So we're trying to get as sort of much out there today as we can and obviously fill in the gaps the rest of the week here. So if I were to just say anything, either team, either side of the ball, any player, anything else from G-Day that you thought was noteworthy enough to say, let me give this a mention here. I kind of rattled through some names a little earlier. And I don't even think I even got all of those on the defensive side of the ball that I would have liked to have mentioned. So – Anything else that you thought sort of stood out from what you saw there on Saturday? Yeah, and this is a little bit of a surprise for me. It was just the number of offensive weapons. I think you saw the rotation of receivers and, and running backs and uh, the, the addition of Etienne, I think, is going to be a big deal. Uh, you know, catching a pass out of, the, out of the backfield, I think you saw at times how dynamic and explosive he can be. It'll be good to see him wearing red rather than orange this yeah. season because he seems to be a playmaker. And then just watching some of the separation that the receivers got on Saturday, not even when they were making catches, but that seems to be a group that, you know, I, last year we saw the emergence of Dylan Bell. And I, I don't think that was exactly anticipated, uh, but it certainly was welcomed. And watching guys like Anthony Evans go out there and make some plays and, and be a factor. Uh, obviously, the addition of Colby, seeing, you know, that, that's a big old joker and yeah. has a big frame. So uh, I'm excited to see the number of weapons that Georgia has. It seems to be uh, that not only do we have one of, if not the best, returning quarterback in college football, 
but you've now added a number of pieces and developed guys in-house that there are weapons across the board. It's going to be a challenge to replace the likes of a Brock Bowers, but uh, when you have as many capable bodies as what we saw on Saturday and what we continue to hear from the coaches and coming out of the practices, um, I'm excited to see how that all develops. I mean, there's only one football and there's a heck of a lot of uh, playmakers that potentially could be real major factors come this fall that uh, seem to be pretty exciting from, from what I saw. Let me do two quick follows up to that. Uh, one of those, you mentioned Colby Young. I thought that was one of the most fun things on Saturday. I only had probably, what, three catches, but one of them is like a contested third down where he has to use his, you know, body to go up and kind of haul in kind of a bullet from uh, Carson back, and he seemingly did that with ease. I mean, he got the red zone touchdown. You know, we didn't really predict on the show. We thought that Arian Smith and Colby Young would both catch touchdowns on Saturday. Didn't quite get that from Arian, but we did get that from Young. And after all we had heard uh, you know, about Colby Young during spring practice. To me, the G-Day game kind of confirmed all those rumors of, yeah, kind of brought here for a purpose, a body type that sort of fits a specific role. I really feel like I saw that from him on Saturday. Uh, agreed. And I think it's important, especially in the red zone, to have big targets. Mm-hmm. You had a Brock Bowers who, you know, played in the slot as much as he did in line tight end, probably more. So, you need a body that's a matchup challenge. And when you get that from a wide receiver against, you know, your standard defensive back that, you know, he's, uh, there's many times where he's going to have a six, seven inch advantage over the defensive back trying to cover him. So I think that really bodes well. And, uh, you know, all, all of what we've heard and what we've seen prior uh, of what he could bring to the table, I think we got a real good glimpse, three catches. Not statistically all that impressive, but uh, that th- the way he used his frame, the matchup potential that you see, I think is a real uh, added bonus for what this offense can uh, present come this fall. I- I'm excited about him. I think everything that we've heard has been very positive, and you, know, you need to have guys like that. I- I- one of the more quiet positions in this game was tight end, mm-hmm. but yet we know there's some very capable bodies that are returning. I mean, it's, it's not Bowers, but Oscar Delp coming back. I mean, I'm excited to see what he does yeah. in that role and in that capacity along with others, including lucky. So there's a number of guys that, that can make those matchups a real challenge for safeties and linebackers. And with Colby on the outside, uh, there's only so many big bodies that defense feels comfortable covering without change in personnel. And uh, that, that's a real good thing for Coach Bobo as he gets ready for game planning, which they didn't do in G-Day, but mm-hmm. he certainly will do uh, in August. My other follow-up to what you said earlier was, I thought the running back group was really fun on Saturday. And I, f- I feel like maybe over the course of the last few weeks, I haven't talked enough about Andrew Paul. I thought Paul was – Kind of a kind of a a fun player to kind of zero in on a little bit on Saturday. Had a couple of really nice runs and kind of showed a, a little bit of a spark. And we obviously still believe that Branson Robinson can eventually be a big part of this. He's you know clearly re- recovering from a serious injury right now, but ETN certainly showed some stuff. Robinson, the kind of bruiser he hoped he could be. Andrew Paul, though, is the guy we really haven't talked very much about. And I thought Paul gave you a little bit on Saturday. That running back group to me was was, was kind of a uh, more fun than I expected group uh, for the G-Day scrimmage. Yeah, and I think Paul is one of those guys that fits multiple molds. It's not, you know, if Etienne, you see him as that dynamic playmaker, let's get him in space, a la James Cook most recently. Uh, but your every down back might look a little different. And and Paul's got that power, the ability to run between the tackles, but also the the dynamic Uh, explosiveness in space that you're looking for obviously you know you don't want to pigeonhole guys but a guy like Roderick is is more of a pounder you know it's third and one I'll tell you who I want to get the ball Mm -hmm. and uh, you feel confident that he can push a pile for a yard or two Uh, whereas Paul's a guy that that's shown he's a little more dynamic in his his capabilities in, in both categories if you will so I'm very excited about that position group I think you've got a number of guys that uh, you like their skill set and how they complement one another, uh, probably more so than what we had last year. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Dejon Edwards, but yeah. uh, I, I think there is probably a higher end overall to this group. 
And really, I think you could say that across the board for this offensive group. I think, you know, you look at every position group with the exception of tight end because you had a, a, a freak of nature last year. And I think you probably feel a little bit better heading into the season with every other position group offensively than you did last year. All right, let me finish with this, if you don't mind. This week, the transfer portal is going to open up for a 15-day period. And, John, as you're aware, there are all kinds of doomsday predictions of a coming apocalypse, not necessarily for Georgia, but for college football overall. We've heard some, you know, sort of talking heads say it's going to be, you know, a situation where some teams get gutted and just, you know, they just, they're going to lose, you know, so many players. And there's going to be, you know, chaos, unprecedented and it's all being powered by, you know, the opportunity to kind of utilize NIL and the fact that there's seemingly no kind of restriction on transfers at all anymore. And I know you and I have talked plenty about this kind of stuff in the past, but, you know, as this gets ready to happen, you know, what should a Georgia football fan's mindset be with, you know, 15 days of just absolute wildness that, that, that might be on the way here? Yeah, I, I think for Georgia, it's more of a depth question than anything else. We're not built like USC or Colorado that has two-thirds of their roster turnover for transfers to walk in and out of the door. That's just not the way Georgia's built. I think the bigger question is you know, what's the depth look like for, for the highly recruited player that you know finds himself at the end of spring, third or fourth on the depth chart, is he willing to – kind of pay his dues and and uh, take that back seat and stick around waiting for that opportunity or growing into that opportunity? Or is he going to chase uh, something that might be a little shinier and a little quicker in a return opportunity for him? Uh, I also think there's, you know, Georgia's never been one to uh, dive deep into the, the transfer portal to get to players, but there might be one or two that we could add that, you know, Coach Smart has identified as areas of need. And, you know, an, another scholarship quarterback is certainly something that's been uh, reported multiple times. That wouldn't be all that surprising. But I think for Georgia fans, this certainly isn't, you know, a, a cautionary tale. We we're going to lose key players. I would be shocked if that were the case. I think uh, more than anything, it's roster management. And we might see some guys a little bit deeper into that depth chart that, could be helpful for Georgia down the road that might say, you know what, uh, I think I'm looking for a, a better opportunity in the short term uh, a little bit quicker. So you know, it's, it's a smaller window. It certainly gets us a heck of a lot closer to game time than, than, than when you're talking about it end of December. But uh, I don't foresee a huge turnover in Georgia's roster. If anything, it's guys you're like, well, I, you know, I kind of get it might be the sentiment that follows if you see a name or two pop up from guys that might be leaving Georgia. John, I love your insight. I appreciate you being here as a part of the program. Always fun to have, you know, some real football. We all got a chance to see at least something closely approximating real football that we all got a chance to see at G day on Saturday and hearing your thoughts on that. Well, it just sort of feels like uh, we're doing exactly what we should be doing on a day like this. So I appreciate that, John, hope you have a, a great week and we will look forward to uh, getting a chance to talk to you very soon. I appreciate it, B.A. It was great to see some football being played, uh, especially when it's the dogs. And uh, it seems like we didn't lose. So that's right. That's always a win, except for the beanie weenies that the players got subjected to. So. Yeah, I guess now <laughs> both sides have to eat the uh, the beanie weenies. This was also a thing when you played, right? The steak or the beanie weenies, that, that was a thing, right? Yeah, we, it certainly wasn't lobster, but it was, uh, it was steak or, or hot dogs. And, you know, it's a... Feather in the cap, a point of pride to be looking over and seeing some guy subjected to uh, Joey Chestnut, Jerry, Joey Chestnut's fare as compared to, you know, a nice big old. Didn't Coach steak. Rick say that some of the players like the hot dogs better than the steak anyway? Don't I remember him saying that at some point in time? Isn't that wild? I mean, that, that's just bizarre to me. But, yeah, there's always a couple guys who oh, prefer a hot dog. That's probably because you lost. <laughs> John, uh, good stuff. Have a good week. We'll look forward to talking to you soon. I appreciate it. Go dogs. Yes, sir. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC through. All right. Fun stuff. Indeed from John Stinchcomb on all of that. And yeah, uh, Carson back, I guess was kind of joking about this, that he was hoping that the whole team would get steak and lobster since they tied Kirby smart says, actually nobody gets steak and lobster. 
Uh, so, uh, yeah, some pretty good stuff there on that. And by the way, if you want to relive a lot of those sort of moments, and we'll play some of that for you here on the show, but if you go to the Dog Nation YouTube page, you can see a lot more of the uh, video from on the field that Cody Chafin shot, or you want to hear the full Kirby Smart press conference, or what uh, the entirety of what Carson Beck had to say. You can get all of that. Do your own version of uh, recapping G-Day there on the Dog Nation YouTube page. A chance to see all of that. Now, I'll tell you this. As we go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean, that being in Athens on Saturday, I saw four different people who were going to be with us on our Dog Nation cruise, which is now just a week away on Allure of the Seas. And that was the universal consensus that everybody's excited about the fact that this year, the Dog Nation cruise, for the first time ever, is going to take place on one of these Oasis class ships with the flow rider on the back and any chance to do the uh, sort of, you know, wave uh, simulator experience, all the various neighborhoods, such as the uh, Central Park. You know, the Central Park's got the rising tide bar where you kind of start off on the Royal Promenade level and almost like a theme park attraction or something like that, it elevates you above to another uh, level on the ship. It's an amazing thing. And if you're watching a video, you kind of look down at that Central Park area where the rising tide bar finally finishes its journey there. How about the back of the ship and the aqua theater you know one of the things that royal Caribbean is the most famous for is really kind of upping the ante when it comes to entertainment on board a cruise ship and the aqua theater is an example of that a high diving show where you got people jumping like 30 40 feet in the air while the ship is moving on the ocean it's just an amazing thing but it's the commitment that royal caribbean has to keep you as entertained and having as good a time as you can possibly have and that's when we can't wait to see so many folks next week on Allure of the Seas. And of course, when it came time for us to plan our Dog Nation cruise, we knew we needed a great travel agent to help us do that. So we said, hey, Royal Caribbean, who do you recommend? And specially selected for us by Royal Caribbean was Jessica Slater. She's doing a great job of getting folks ready for a great Royal Caribbean cruise vacation. She, she can do the same thing for you here in 2024 there as well. You can give her a call, 770-718-9147. That's 770-718-9147. You can also email her, jslater at dreamvacations.com. And she can plan your Royal Caribbean cruise vacation the same way that she's planned so many of mine and the same way that she's planned everyone's for our Dog Nation cruise here. She can do that for you there as well. All right. Let's get ready to go cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean right now. And total confession, there's been a weird thing in the media the last couple of weeks, and I guess in a roundabout way we've contributed to this. A little bit of, I don't want to say dispute, but perhaps... Uh, an array of, uh, I guess, reporting out there about when the transfer portal thing actually begins. If you look on some sites, you'll see April 15th, but technically it actually begins April 16th. It's 15 days, which the 16th would be day one through the 30th, which would be day 15. So technically the portal begins tomorrow. And as we talked to John Stinchcomb about, there's a lot of people buckling seatbelts and getting ready to get settled in just to sort of see how wild this ride gets. And do we see, you know, high-profile players going from one team to the next? What we know is, is there are teams that desperately need talent. Teams that, you know, perhaps had coaches that came on board late, or perhaps they thought the transfer portal, you know, took a lot from them, and they're going to try to go out and be aggressive. Other teams, uh, and you'd put Georgia probably in this category, a little bit more interested in just sort of holding on to what they do have. You know, Georgia added its big-name players probably in the winter portal, you know, Kirby Smart did allude to, you know, the notion that they still are kind of interested in that fourth scholarship quarterback. But that player, if Georgia adds a, another quarterback to the mix here, is not going to be a player that the average fan probably views as a recognizable name. It's going to likely be someone who played the group of five level and likely be the kind of person that if, if, they, if Georgia does add it, that you'll have to go and kind of check the stats out to say, well, is this a good player or not? Am I happy with who this player is or not? That's likely to be the kind of player Georgia adds if it does add someone but nonetheless everybody's sort of buckling up for kind of a wild run here and we'll uh, be looking to see just how wild that it gets Saturday was a day of a lot of spring games Georgia obviously put itself on display both Alabama and Ohio State had spring games there as well and really big crowds for both those games I believe both reported uh, crowds in excess of 70 something thousand uh, certainly in the case of Ohio State they had a big crowd there at the horseshoe and you know, I, there used to be a time which you maybe have bragging rights about which fan base had the biggest crowd and who did what. And maybe Ohio State and Alabama are going to brag about the crowds they put together. Perhaps they should. But for me, I was actually somewhat comforted by this. I do like spring games. I want them to matter. I don't like the Mickey Mouse stuff you see going on other places where 
Um, it seems like it's barely even football, and it's more like just fun and games, um, skills competition type stuff. I do like football that feels like football, and I, I really don't know how much the actual spring games themselves prepare you for the fall, but I like to believe they do some. Kirby Smart seems to believe that a little bit, I think. And so the fact that the spring game in Columbus was the thing that Buckeyes fans wanted to go see, and the fact that uh, – the spring game in Alabama and Tuscaloosa there was the kind of thing their fans wanted to go see. I, I kind of I'm, I'm glad about that. I, I'm glad that that G Day is not the only place where spring games can sort of still be a big deal. Now both Alabama and Ohio State had some weird scoring systems and weird rules in place, but fans still showed up. Now I did hear the Ohio State quarterback situation on Saturday not exactly stellar. So. As we start to go through the, these other spring games and who did what and how all of this went, I think one of the sort of big takeaways sort of outside of G-Day from Saturday was maybe not the best day for the Ohio State quarterbacks overall. So, you know, keep that in mind as there may be a little bit of a nitpicking about a certain throw a certain quarterback may have made for Georgia and sometimes even some of the stuff involving Carson Beck. Just keep in mind that, you know, uh, you know, perhaps at a place like Ohio State, there were even more significant concerns than that as it relates to the quarterback position. Uh, perhaps something to consider there. There was a very interesting story within the last couple of days in the LA Daily News, which is one of the news entities out there that covers USC. And this is, I would say, confirmation of something we've talked about before. The rumor mill was that at, at times there have been transfers to USC. One of the names that comes up, just to be completely honest, was Jordan Addison, the wide receiver, who left Pitt to go to USC, um, allegedly for big NIL dollars. And there were rumors that maybe not all the promises that were made from an NIL standpoint were actually being kept by USC. This is obviously relevant because we're in a situation where Georgia and USC are fighting over some of the same recruits and perhaps some of the same players. And this piece from the LA Daily News, if we can take it at face value, I'd say comes across as just a little bit damning uh, because it – goes through a series of uh, situations in which a player to USC was sort of promised one thing on, a, on an NIL standpoint, and the actual truth turned out to be far different. I'm going to read you a few sentences here, and I apologize for reading, but I just think this is interesting enough that I want to make sure I give it to you the, the way the LA News put it out. Telling the story of a player and his family saying they visited USC, they had a meeting with the USC general manager, a guy named Dave Emmerich, and they were offered an NIL valuation through what, what's called the House of Victory, which is basically their NIL, uh, 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 you know, collective, whatever. And uh, um, in reality, though, when the player chose to go to USC, the LA Daily News reports that what House of Victory offered once the player arrived was half of what they had initially discussed with their visit. So you go on a visit, they say, if you come here, you're going to get X dollars. But in actuality, the L.A. Daily News reports the player actually got half of what he was promised. And the contract was broken down into a combination of passive and active income that they didn't expect. According to a screenshot of the contract provided to the Southern California News Group, which is the company, I guess, that owns the L.A. Daily News, the player would be paid a monthly sum for House of Victory to use his name, image, and likeness, and an additional payment in the contract hinge on certain amount of promotional deliverables being met, such as the completion of a post on social media or a physical event appearance. Now listen to this. Here's where it gets crazy. So the player was offered some money, a car, and an apartment. And we saw in the case of Bear Alexander the picture of the apartment that he was supposedly living in out in L.A. But this is what the L.A. Daily News reports about this particular player uh, for going to USC. The apartment, is they, they say, became more of a burden than a comfort because the player was forced to pay rent of his own accord off his salary from House of Victory. Both recurring usage rights and completed deliverable payments became inconsistent, not on the first of the month or biweekly basis, according to a screenshot of the parent's bank account alerts, meaning that they were paying him some money but not like on a regular basis when they were supposed to, sort of sporadically uh, making those payments. Eventually, the L.A. Daily News says the player was dinged enough for late fees on rent that the parent reached out several times to USC to express frustration. Wasn't pretty conversations to try to, though the parent says, to try to reach a solution of more consistent pay. They ended up receiving the full value of the contract, but the memory of, of a larger valuation still lingers. So in other words, 
you had this player who was promised a, a, an apartment, but come to find out he had to pay rent on the apartment. Now, we want to go back to sort of a bygone age in college football like a few years ago. What we were told is, is that, you know, the things that college football players had been getting for decades, free room, free board, all oh, these players deserve so much more than that. That's what we're going to usher in this NIL era so the players can get what they deserve. But now you've got a player who's not even getting free rent anymore, according to the LA Daily News, that players have always gotten a place to live for free. And now through this NIL age, which is supposed to be for the benefit of the players, now this guy allegedly is having to pay his own rent. And the money that he got promised was uh, was half of what he actually uh, what he got. Buyer beware when it comes to a place like USC and perhaps NIL, you know, more broadly, but certainly in this case, USC buyer beware of a program like that when this is the kind of reporting that's out there. And as it relates to college football in general, let me just tell you this, that anytime powerful people work very hard to make something less than transparent, there's always a purpose behind that. Anything that's complicated is complicated for a reason. Anything that's sort of shrouded in secrecy is shrouded in secrecy for a reason. Why don't the people that run college athletics want more transparency about NIL and who's getting paid what and who's doing what? I can promise you this. It is not for the benefit of the players. It is not for the benefit of the players. And when the actual truth of NIL is being hidden, I think it's a very fair question to ask. What exactly is it that you're trying to hide, and why is it to your benefit to hide it? Stories like this from the L.A. Daily News perhaps shed some light on that to the extent that we're able to take that at face value. I'll also mention this. This happened on Saturday. News coming out of the now Big 12, where Arizona State finds itself. Former dog, Heinz Ward, uh, set to become the wide receivers coach there at Arizona State. Nice to see on screen there, Ward from his playing days there at Georgia, black stripe down the helmet. That's still sort of a weird thing to see. Uh, but nonetheless, that's taking it back to the Heinz Ward era. And here's all I'll tell you about this. Anytime Georgia has a coach opening, like the one that it had that James Coley filled uh, a couple of months ago, a lot of Georgia fans wonder, Heinz Ward, who has expressed some desire to be on the Georgia coaching staff, could he be in line to get a coaching job like this? And the only thing we can say with certainty is it certainly doesn't feel like right now that's a connection that's ready to be made. You know, Georgia's a program that keeps its cards pretty close to the vest. The fact that Ward has spoken so openly about this sort of doesn't quite feel like it's in keeping with the typical way of Georgia doing business. But the one thing that you cannot say is that you cannot say that Ward, who was a very well-played NFL star, who had great success, Super Bowl MVP, things like that, you can't say that he's got too big of an ego to do the hard work to become a coach. That he has been more than happy to pay his dues. Spring Football League, working for the Jets, briefly employed by FAU. This is a guy who's doing the real work to put a real resume together. So, Heinz Ward apparently was not a legitimate candidate for Georgia's wide receiver coaching job when it came open a couple of months ago. But as Ward continues to do the work to become the kind of coach who has the kind of experience that a place like Georgia would notice no matter where you went to school, no matter what your background is, Maybe one day in the future, Heinz Ward could be a legitimate coaching candidate for some coaching opening there at UGA. He seems to be doing the kind of work that would sort of put him in that kind of conversation, and you certainly notice that coming off of uh, Saturday. And we will make that cruising around the SEC courtesy of Royal Caribbean. So a couple of things as we wrap up here today. First of all, we had a great time being at the UGA bookstore there on Saturday. And so many folks came by to see us, and I kind of joked, you know, people talk about how far they travel to get to G-Day. I said on this particular Saturday, the rest of you are all playing for second on that because we had a chance to speak to our buddy Dave Snow, who's a fairly frequent commenter for us there at DogNation.com. Dave traveling over from Nairobi, Kenya to attend the game, and he did so bearing gifts. How about this from the U.S. Embassy? I'll see if we can show this to you. The U.S. Embassy in Nairobi, Kenya there. Uh, really cool with the seal here on the front. If you look on the back, it's got the giraffes, very much in keeping with what you'd expect to see from Kenya there. Obviously, the beautiful wildlife that lives in a country like that. So Dave brought this gift to me. What an amazing thing, and I'll cherish this. My kids also love this there as well. So, Dave, thank you for that. 
Uh, we'll also give a golden shoe out. We have the final now of our golden shoe bracket pool. Congratulations to Jonah Carney, uh, who uh, his team was Homa Land Security. This was kind of a fun thing about this. Everybody got to kind of choose their own sort of team name for this. And in honor of Max Homa, who gave it a nice run all weekend long, Jonah Carney went with Homa Land Security. And by one stroke, uh, Homa Land Security has won the uh, Golden Shoe Masters Pool. His team of Scotty Scheffler and Max Homa, uh, Terrell Hatton, uh, the dog Harris English, who didn't have the best day but still contributed to the winning score. Uh, everybody who made our top four, that's uh, first place, second place, and a T for three, all had Scotty Scheffler, and obviously Scheffler winning the gold, the green jacket for the second time. So, Jonah, we will be reaching out to you and hopefully reaching out to a lot of the folks who were in this. We have a pretty good idea for some prizes that I want to send out. I think this could be uh, fun. So we'll kind of be getting in touch with a lot of people about that. But, Jonah, we'll give you a chance to celebrate on air with us your win in the Golden Shoe Masters Pool. Congratulations to you on that. And what a fun time it was watching the events of the Masters here this weekend. Lousy, stinking Gators. They had their spring game on Saturday. Um, you know, listen, it is what it is over there right now. 1,255 days. That's how long it's been since they've beaten Georgia. That is our Gator Hater Updater. Y'all have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Pella Window and Door of Georgia. We'll look forward to talking to you then. And on video. Time now for the R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, when you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs, they show up on time. They do the work that's promised for the price that's promised. You can trust them on all of that. All right, let's get some comments here. And uh, we'll see what's on everybody's mind post G Day. Uh, JP and others talking about uh, Heinz Ward. And look, I find this to be very impressive for a guy that has made a lot of money that would not have to do the sort of low level coaching that Ward has been doing uh, unless you really wanted to be serious as a coach. I, I find that to be very impressive for, for Heinz Ward. He is clearly doing the work necessary to become the kind of coach that would. I think be on on Georgia's radar here. And one thing that we understand is is that the job of coaching, the job of playing are two very different things. That obviously sometimes we see great players who become, you know, very good coaches, but but maybe not always. Um in the case of in, in the case of Ward though, is that after being a great player, now he seems to be doing the kind of hard work, the sort of daily grind that gives him a chance to also be a great coach too. And I, I find that to be pretty impressive. I do. K Dog checking in. We're glad to have you here. Um, JP says, I've got zero concerns about back. Uh, the defense knew what was coming uh, and then uh, created some extra pressure on him. Yeah, like in the NFL, you know, passing plays are about like 80% more efficient on average than running plays are. But any good NFL coach will tell you, even if that's true, you still probably should only throw it about 60% of the time because one of the things that makes the passing play so efficient is the fear of running the ball. That if you just looked at the stats, and this is one of the things that's kind of gotten me off the math nerd thing a little bit, that if you just look at the stats, well, in the NFL, that would lead you to believe you should never run it because passing plays are almost exponentially more efficient than running plays are. But it's the fear of the run that makes the passing play uh, a little more potent. And it's the same thing for the kinds of passing plays you call. Once again, we hear this in college football all the time, that the least efficient play that you can run is a fade pattern towards the corner of the end zone. That's the least efficient play in all of the playbook. But what coaches will tell you is, because like the, the, the math guys will tell you, you know, it's the slant pattern that actually is more valuable than the fade pattern. But what, um, the coaches will tell you is the only reason why the slant pattern works is because teams have to at least respect the idea that you might throw the fade. And so the point is, is that not knowing what's coming is a very valuable thing for an offense to have against a defense. And once the defense feels like it knows what's coming, all of a sudden the job of stopping a defense becomes a lot easier. In fact, this is one of the things that always stood out to me. We had dog nation appreciation a few years ago. When we had the big event with like Roquan Smith and uh, Sonny Michelle and Nick Chubb and, Lorenzo Carter, Davin Bellamy, the the funny part of that became that um, they were talking about how one time 
Roquan and Sony almost got into a fight at Georgia practice, as was told uh, on that particular night, because uh, I think it was Sony felt like that somehow the Georgia defense was playing the play. I remember being like a high school basketball player. This is always a very controversial thing. Anytime the defense was kind of, instead of just sort of playing straight up, kind of cheating because they thought they knew what was coming, which when you're facing your own teammates running the own offense, of course you know what's coming. Um, and uh, uh, Sony felt like that, that, that Roquan was kind of cheating a little bit on, on a, like a screen pass or something like that. And they got really upset with each other. And there's just a huge advantage defensively if you feel like you know what's coming. And some of that may have been true on, on GA on Saturday. Brian Keith Scarborough pointing out something that we had, uh, saw mentioned on Saturday that uh, there was a moment on special teams for Florida on Saturday where they once again lined up with uh, only 10 players in the field. So Florida still being Florida when it comes to stuff like that. Let me go to YouTube here, see how those folks are doing. On YouTube, uh, Croaking123 says Troy Bowles played some in the secondary just to get him on the field because of how deep we are. Yeah, it's interesting. I'd heard said about Bowles before that, hey, this is a guy that could potentially be a safety, so you kind of wonder if we eventually see even more of that from him. Um, kind of an interesting exchange with Kirby and a reporter on Saturday, too, about what he still wants to see more of from Bowles. This is after Kirby had said some nice things about Troy at one point in time this spring, and it's almost like Troy didn't, or I should say Kirby didn't 100% remember having said that. Um, let us see what else. Uh, Daddy's channel predicting that Jaden Riddell is going to be a problem. He says maybe this year, but definitely next year. Yeah, this is a playmaking uh, tight end. This is a big recruiting win. You know, for all the talk about, you know, what Missouri at times has been able to do against Georgia, especially with in-state type players, you know, big dollars, things like that. You know, that's an example of a recruiting win that Georgia got over Missouri that may prove to eventually be pretty valuable. Uh, I think you're right about that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Paul Moon, the subject of Sam and Pemba. Yeah, I didn't see much from him on Saturday. That doesn't necessarily mean a good thing or a bad thing. Just didn't stand out to me too much. Um, Howard Eubanks says, proven players do not get a lot of snaps. They know what they have. G-Day was the time to show off the backups and freshmen can do. Yeah, another one of those names that I kind of rattled off a bunch of names earlier. A name that I didn't mention probably should have was Gabe Harris. I thought there was some good stuff from Harris on Saturday. Um, back in front says that Charleston Heston is going to be on the beach damning mankind again before the Gators win again, which is very funny. Um, I haven't seen... Have y'all seen the new Planet of the Apes movie? I haven't seen that or really any movie. Uh, but I did see some of, like, uh, the first, like, Planet of the Apes reboot they did a few years ago. I saw that. I thought that was pretty good. Um, uh, let us see what else. Uh, Stick D's pointing out Anthony Evans, four catches, 75 yards. You loved that. Yeah, I thought Evans looked really good on Saturday. And a nice throw and catch. Stockton to Evans there pretty early in the game. Um, uh, Nature Gator says he couldn't find a, a, a play in which 11 players were, weren't were on the field. That, that, that's, that was the reporting that came from Gainesville. Uh, all, all, I, all I can do is talk about what's been reported. Um, Brian Buttry checking in on an interesting... Uh, uh, target in the class of 2027. Brian, you keep us updated on that. Sounds like that's a pretty impressive prospect, so keep us updated on that, please. Um, Howard Eubanks predicts that uh, ETN is going to run for 200 yards uh, uh, against somebody uh, this season. Perhaps we will see that. Croaking 123, but we saw Croaking on Saturday. It was good to see him. We've had a lot of linebackers do very well in the NFL. Tendall and Monty Rice are still playing, drawing a blank, but there was a guy who played well for the Giants for a few years. That's Tay Crowder, right? Uh, Crowder was um, his seventh-round pick. Was was Crowder uh, what they call Mr. Irrelevant, the final pick in the draft? I believe he was, um, but went on to have a career with the New York Giants, right? 
uh, Darian Ford saying what is going to be blasphemy to many in our audience. Darian, you have set yourself up to, to take some heat here. Darian, in, if this was on X, I believe they call this engagement uh, uh, farming. He says we need to get that black stripe back on the helmet. I can't – listen, Darian, I, I've liked your comments for years. You've been one of my – one of our longtime commenters, and I've always been, you know, uh, someone who viewed your uh, opinions very favorably. But I can't go with you on the black stripe. I can't go with you on that. Can't go with you on that, Darian. And I'm guessing you'll probably hear it from some Georgia fans there on that. Uh, Stick D said Xavier McLeod had two sacks on Saturday. That's 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 pretty good. I like that. I like that. Let me uh, get some Facebook commentary here. On Facebook, let's see how folks are doing over there. Uh, William Camacho says, I was so impressed with the first and second team defense. They can make a difference this year and uh, 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 more of a difference this year than the last two years. Hey, you could be right, William. I liked a lot of what I saw there as well. Um. Eric Devorncy says, we can't be under 85 yet, right? Uh, Bill Sanders saying, he's talking about the, the overall scholarship number. Bill saying that I think we're at 90 or 92. Yeah, I thought it was somewhere around that 90 mark right now. So Georgia does technically probably need to lose some players. Uh, and it probably already kind of knows some of that kind of stuff. Um, oh, yeah, and by the way, um, I, think, I think we mentioned this. Uh, a Kenneg Bond, the defensive lineman who committed, I promise you we'll do plenty on him this week. We just did not have time for that today, but I promise you we'll do plenty on the Kenneg uh on the show here this week. Uh, I also heard it was a good a good day overall for Georgia recruiting too. Uh, uh, Mike Mazell predicting that Mikael Williams could be Defensive Player of the Year for the SEC. Listen, uh, Mike, I, w- I would say anything like that's possible. Bill Sanders looking forward to the Braves in Houston tonight. Yeah, big series there. Um, let's see what else is going on. Uh, Chris Slim White says he thinks that Roderick Robbins can be Derrick Henry 2.0. Listen, I loved the physical running style that Roderick put on display on Saturday. And I kind of like seeing him involved a little bit in the passing game, too. I thought that was kind of fun. I kind of enjoyed that. Uh Brody Williams asking about Trevor Etienne status of the first game. Obviously, people know what happened there with the the DUI. So just to be completely honest, I really don't know where this is going. If it's traditional DUI, then I think what tradition would hold that he would likely miss the first game. But this, in some respects, is not a traditional situation, the fact that it was – DUI less safe, meaning that we've been told what that means is, is that he was, you know, basically cited and charged for being under 21, not for having a blood alcohol content above the legal limit. Now, I take drinking and driving very seriously, so everybody obviously understands that. Hopefully, we don't have to like caveat this discussion by saying that. I take drinking and driving very seriously, so I am certainly not looking to pretend like drinking and driving is no big deal. But in terms of your question, a football-related question, you know, what I am not sure of is what happens if, as is his legal right to do so, what happens if the if the charge gets pled down to a lesser offense and it's no longer a DUI? At that point in time, does, does ETN have to miss the first game if legally he's no longer charged with DUI? And this is where this kind of always comes back to for me. Then when it comes to alleged crime and punishment for that alleged crime, to me, this is more about a legal proceeding than what we expect coaches to do. And I feel that way for Georgia and anybody else in college football, that, you know, ETN has the same right to the legal process anybody else has. And if when it's all said and done, if he's no longer charged with DUI, does that, does that change how he's treated by Georgia? Perhaps it doesn't. Perhaps it does. I honestly don't know. So, um, we have a little bit of a precedent to say, well, if it is a DUI, we sort of know how Georgia's treated this kind of thing in the past. But 
what if it's no longer a DUI? Does that change this? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, and uh, Keith Volt says innocent until proven guilty, which obviously we 100% agree with. But it's also one of those situations of, well, let's say he is guilty, but 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 the, you know, the the prosecu the prosecutor, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, is is satisfied with allowing him to be guilty of a lesser offense, which happens all the time. That's not preferential treatment for a football player. That's what the name of the game is, right? Um, so I, I I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. Terry Rigdon says Clemson fans thinking now they've got an edge on us talking lots of smack. So my memory before the 2021 game was is that because it was week one, maybe, and because at the time Clemson was really good, it seems like they talked a bunch of crazy stuff, right? Like, I mean, just crazy stuff. I think what it is, in some respects, I have a theory about this, that Clemson kind of lives in a little bit of an isolated world in that they're kind of tucked up there in the South Carolina upstate, there's not a lot of ACC teams similar to them. And, you know, they're in the state of South Carolina, which is a SEC state, but Columbia is like way over kind of like down east, right? And it's a lot more like into like SEC country, whereas like South Carolina upstate is kind of getting you out of the SEC footprint a little bit. You're kind of going towards more like the ACC, you know, Carolinas, right? You're, you're kind of getting into like true ACC country up there a little bit more. And so I think that Clemson fans, this is my theory, that they live in a fairly insulated world where when you hear Clemson fans saying, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, honest truth is they probably really believe that because I don't think they have access to the same information that, that, that we all do. That, you know, the Clemson like media apparatus is very different. It's not nearly as built out and as big as you think it might be for, you know, a team that's won national championships. It's it's a little bit smaller. It's a little bit more kind of siloed off. And I think that they I think Clemson fans fall prey to a lot of misinformation, if you want to know the honest truth. Uh that's my theory on some of that. All right, let's do a couple more comments. We'll get ready to get out of here. Um Let us see what else. Stick D says, watch out for Andrew Paul. Yes, yeah, Stick, I thought he was good. I thought he was good on Saturday. I thought he was. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Paul Moon mentioned Jake Pope. Yeah, Pope had a couple nice moments there on Saturday. Um, kind of nice to see. G. Gray says, when we had Saban, I knew Bama would be top four. I'm optimistic with Kalen DeBoer, but also nervous. Georgia fans, why are you worried? Kirby is your coach. His defense will always be legit. I don't know that I've seen any outright worry, uh, you know, from Georgia fans coming off of G-Day. What I feel like I've seen, G. Gray says, is that college football fans of all stripes, Georgia fans, Bama fans, whatever else, they like to just sort of get deep and, like, break down every small thing because it's just – really, really like college football, and it's just really fun to kind of get deep on some of these subjects. That's kind of what I've seen seen uh, more so overall. And I will say, I know a lot of our audience gives you a hard time, but I appreciate your sort of comparison between DeBoer and Saban. You know, it is a different feeling. And there's a chance that Kalen DeBoer picks up where he left off. DeBoer got the Alabama job because he won uh, at, at Washington. And I don't mind telling you, G, that – the person that I would have said would have been the best for the Alabama job would have probably been Dan Lanning. I think that Lanning is such a sharp coach. But the truth is, is head-to-head -head, three times, DeBoer's beaten him. And so I do think you got to give him some credit for that. So and there's a chance that DeBoer shows that he was hired for the Alabama coaching job for a reason. But the level of confidence that an Alabama fan would have typically had in previous years when Nick Saban was your head coach, you probably don't have that right now. And I think that's really fair. Uh, let us see what else. Scott Busby enjoyed seeing you there. Uh, checking in from Montgomery, Alabama. Scott, great to see you at the UGA bookstore on Saturday. I tell you, I love those opportunities to talk to Georgia fans. It's such a fun thing. And Scott, I was so happy to get a chance to see you there too. Um, Lance D says that DeBoer can be a good coach for Bama, but he just can't control 
the uh, unrealistic expectations of Bama fans. Yeah, I kind of wonder how – I mean, you're going to see uh, – as we get closer to the season, I, I do think it will be interesting to see what the actual expectations of Bama fans are. Like, how good do they really think they'll be You know, here this year? Um, G. Gray says that Lanning wasn't quite ready for the, the pressure of the Alabama job. Maybe that's the case. I also think that Lanning – for now, feels like he's got a good situation at Oregon. Uh, less pressure overall. I think you're right about that. But look, on paper, you know, I would say that on paper, Oregon's a better team than Michigan is this upcoming season. And I would say right there alongside Ohio State moving forward, you know, among the very best programs in the Big Ten, at least for the foreseeable future. Randy Payne, who I briefly saw on Saturday, I was trying to get into the bookstore. They were super crowded to do the show, and I saw Randy he checks in from Tifton, Georgia today, and we'll see Randy coming up next week on our Dog Nation cruise, which we are excited about. All right, final comments. we got to get ready to go. Low Country Dog says that Clemson can't win without a quarterback from the state of Georgia, which is very funny. Um, uh, let's see what else. JP mentioning the school policy on DUI. Yeah, like I said before, but what we don't know is, you know, is how that changes. Um if it's a lesser charge uh, and, you know, if it was just as matter of fact as, as that, you know, perhaps Kirby smart would have already confirmed it. But as you know, Kirby's not going to confirm anything along those lines. Um, Eric Dvornsky also pointing out what we kind of mentioned earlier is that to divorce credit, you know, he did get three wins against, uh, against Oregon and perhaps did so with lesser talent. Good point. Um, Let's see what else. Anything else before we go? All right, we're going to wrap it up for today. All right, good stuff, y'all. And listen, the rest of the week is going to be very much like this. I promise there's a lot on G-Day. There's a lot on UGA recruiting. Georgia got a nice commit. Seems like made a pretty strong impression. Some other guys there as well. Transfer portal nonsense as, as well. So we'll cover all of that with all of you. Y'all check out RS Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, electric needs. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. You can trust them on all of that. Uh, they'll get your air conditioning unit. Tune back up to factory fresh specs. It is a good time to do that because it is hot outside. So y'all check that out. And uh, have a good day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Dog Nation Daily presented by Pella Window Indoor of Georgia. We'll look forward to talking to you then.